Hello darlings and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Robin Hahn and I make videos about opera stuff, disabled humans, and occasionally disabled opera human stuff. If that sounds like your speed, subscribe for more. And that's what we are up to today, friends. So let's talk about the unsung opera diva who terrified Maria Callas and who learned to sing from bed. I wanted to try a new type of video out today, something I'm calling opera profiles. I mean, needless to say, it's been a stressful year and learning about my favorite opera singers, composers, librettists, and directors for a super enthusiastic opera nerd like me sounds honestly like a fun escape. I'm starting today with a video on the life of one of my favorite sopranos, Virginia Zayani. <laughs> Zayani is a Romanian soprano most strongly associated with the Italian repertoire, and most specifically the role of Violetta in La Traviata, and was one of Italy's most celebrated and treasured operatic artists in the 1950s. But her career spanned almost four decades. She became known as La Soluta, the Absolute One, Violetta Supreme. And even today, some of the opera greats still sometimes seem to talk about her in hushed tones, from Teresa Stratus to Angela Gheorghiu. If you didn't know about this goat, friends, goat here meaning greatest of all time, now you know. Ziani was born Virginia Zehan in 1925 in a tiny little village in Transylvania, Romania. <laughs> no, no vampire jokes. She's a real person. And this is history. She fell in love with opera at the age of nine at a production of Madama Butterfly, and often speaks about music entering her soul at a very young age, when she would imitate the birds she heard in her garden. When she was 12, Zayani was encouraged by a choir director to pursue lessons, and despite opposition from her parents, she in fact paid for those lessons herself, with money earned from part-time work and the occasional church performance. By age 13, a benefactor in her village was paying for her to take more formal lessons in Bucharest, where she was initially confused for a mezzo soprano. Soprano. Relatable content. There's actually not a lot of information about this on the internet, but as a child, Ziani had serious bronchial issues, and from what I can tell, has stories of having to learn her technique flat on her back in bed because of them. Talk about learning vocal stamina! In fact, very little about her childhood and young adulthood was particularly easy. A fact which she later used to say would help her imbue her performances with emotion. I found another story about an incident in World War II when Zayani was 18 and Russian army deserters came to her village. She hid, terrified, in a wheat field. And when she came back to town, she discovered that the soldiers had killed a woman she'd been very close to. And still she sang because, as she says in an interview with Shmapra, I had a very strange destiny. I started very young, I studied very hard and I never loved anything more than singing. I think it is something that has to be born with you. You never know what will be happening next, but something or somebody guides you towards what you love but don't necessarily understand. And that gives you the power to invest time and energy into discovering what is your calling in life. Same, maestra. Same. After the war, Zayani moved to Italy to study with famed Russian coloratura soprano Lydia Lipkovska. Together, they quickly opened up her voice to its higher register and solidified her technique as a soprano. Lipkovska also coached her in four roles in particular, Violetta, Lassenis Manon, Marguerite in Faust, and Mimi in La Bohème, which all became staples of her early career. Later on, she sought out Aureliano Pertile as a teacher, a dramatic tenor who had long been one of her greatest operatic heroes for his amazing diction and the beauty of his phrasing. She just showed up to his doorstep one day, and when he opened the door, Zayani says she burst into tears and couldn't talk. I maybe don't recommend this strategy in 2021. After hearing her story, Pertile took her on as a student, giving her private lessons and letting her attend his master classes on a non-paying basis. Instead of payment, she repaid him by running errands and doing household chores. Yep. He taught her clear Italian diction, and by the time she was 22, he decided she was ready to do auditions. So that year, with absolutely no stage experience, she made her debut in Bologna as Violetta, the first of 648 times she would eventually do the role. She was an immediate success. Soon she was making debuts, usually as Violetta, but also as many other roles that straddled the divide between the lyric and coloratura repertoire. In the major European opera houses from Vienna to Paris, 
Paris. And in 1956, after actually previously declining an offer of engagement from the house, made her debut at La Scala in Handel's Giulio Cesare. Now you gotta understand something about Zayani here. At this point in her life, she literally felt too busy for love. Let's take a moment for another truly iconic quote from an interview posted in Gramilano.com. I had decided never to marry because with singing there was no time. In the first four or five years of my career, I made my debut in seven operas. Who had time to fall in love in that time? Just. Ugh. All that said, it was in this production that she re-met Italian bass Nicola Rossi Lemeni. They technically met before in 1952, when Zayani replaced Callas in a production of I Puritani in Florence, but in that production she'd only ever seen him in a massive white beard, and she had had no idea he was in his 30s, and a pretty handsome dude at that. Within a week, he'd asked her to marry him. Within three weeks, she said yes. Later on, she would say that she had only ever loved once in her life, and it was Nicola. It's all so romantic. By this point in her life, she was a superstar, a queen of many of the major opera houses around the world. She created the role of Blanche in Poulenc's Dialogue des Carmelites, helped resurrect Lucia di Lammermoor as a key piece of the operatic repertoire, became one of the very few sopranos ever to sing all three leading ladies in Tales of Hoffmann, and then of course made that legendary last minute Covent Garden debut I talk about in my top five vintage recording video. Giovanni Battista Menechini, former husband of Maria Callas, even told Zayani, and I quote, Virginia, I have to tell you, you are one of the very few sopranos my wife is frightened of. I love this lady. I love this story. I love this era of opera history. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but then you ask, if she's such an icon, why don't we have recordings of her like we do have Tebaldi, Callas, or Sutherland? Well, she was offered a contract with Decca, but when they said they had too many bases on their roster and couldn't add her husband to the contract too, she turned them down. Simple as that. To this day, we're left with few formal studio recordings and mostly bootleg performance records because of it. Over time, as her voice matured, Zayani turned to bigger, heavier repertoire, like Tosca, Madama Butterfly, and Adriana Le Couvreur, performances which were met with as much acclaim as her lighter repertoire. Eventually, she even sang a few Wagnerian roles, Senta in Flying Dutchman and Elsa in Lohengrin. All in all, she sang almost 70 roles over the course of her career, which is a truly massive number worthy of acclaim all by itself, and only ever cancelled two shows anywhere, ever. Not that I'm suggesting that you have to struggle to be a good artist, but when you do go through that much adversity and you love singing that much, you do develop a really, really, really excellent work ethic. Sayani officially retired from the stage in 1982, after beginning to teach with her husband at Indiana University two years before. I don't have any corroborating sources from this, but one of the sources I found suggested that at least at one time she held the record for the teacher with the most students ever to win the Met Opera competitions. Her past students include Sylvia McNair, Elina Garancha, Elizabeth Futral, Eileen Perez, and more. Her husband passed away in 1991, and she never remarried, eventually retiring to Florida in 2002, where she still teaches promising young singers today. Virginia Zayani was made a commander of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic in 1965, a recipient of the Royal Decoration of Nihil Sine Deo in 2011, and a Knight of the Order of the Star of Romania in 2016. She has been awarded Indiana University's President's Medal for Excellence, the National Association of Teachers of Singing Lifetime Achievement Award, the Marcello Giordani Lifetime Achievement Award, and has been named Classical Singer Magazine's Teacher of the Year. The inaugural season of the Virginia Zayani Festival was held in Romania in 2017. She is the low-key opera icon that learned her technique while chronically ill that you didn't know you needed. Virginia Zayani, la soluta, has a legacy of impeccable artistry and technique, heart-wrenching performances, and a true passion for the art form. I hope you've enjoyed this biography, and that maybe you've learned a thing or two about one of the unsung greats of opera. Pun intended. Wait, before you go, this is the point where I let you know that if you stay to the end, you get to see cool, funny outtakes. So stay tuned. If you like this type of educational content, please like the video down below to let me know. And remember, if you were looking for a joyful little corner of the internet where we could learn about opera, disability, queerness, cats, and tea, you have found it. And if you weren't looking for it, you have found it anyway. So go hit that subscribe button and ring the little bell. Keep the comment section full of joy and light, and I will see you in my next video. With money earned, blah, blah, blah. maestra, stra, stra, stra. Oh, no.
when I spilled all my tea all over me. Crap. Covered in tea. <laughs> Dang it, I can't say this line. Rihanna. Oh, I can't say that one. I, no. Why God, why today? Why are they lawn mowing on recording day? I liked my audio as it was, but now editing's gonna be hard because... Gotta love this one little zit right here.